Welcome to the Jewish Drinking Show, where we explore drinking in Jewish wisdom, history, practices, and more in the pursuit of healthy, mindful, and yes, joy-filled approaches to drinking in Jewish life. Hi. Hi. Welcome to the 98th episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm very excited to discuss this episode's topic of medieval Haggadah art with Ho with first-time guest of the show, Professor Mark Michael Epstein. Hi, Drew. Nice to nice to be here, and uh, love your podcast. Big fan. Thank you so kindly. Thank you so much. So, for those less familiar with Professor Epstein here, he has been teaching at Vassar since 1992, and currently serves as director of Jewish studies at Vassar. And he is also a graduate of that 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 uh, college in Ohio, Oberlin College. So, there's an Ohio connection, which I'm very excited about as an Ohio native. <laughs> Um, he received his PhD at Yale University and did much of his graduate research at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And he has written on various topics in visual and material culture produced by, for, and about Jews. His most recent book, Skies of Parchment, Seas of Ink, Jewish Illuminated Manuscripts, was the winner of the National Jewish Book Award. But, and this is now more relevant to our conversation, his The Medieval Haggadah. Art, Narrative, and Religious Imagination, published by Yale in 2011, was selected by the London Times Literary Supplement as one of the best books of 2011. So that brings us to our topic. I mean, medieval Haggadahs are, um, I mean, you you literally wrote the book about it. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. So my question, and I think I think when it comes to Haggadahs, when it comes to, to Passover, it's hard to ignore the drinking aspects of the Seder. And so... Naturally, I'm very curious about Haggadahs. Like, how much do we see wine? I mean, we can't ignore the wine as far as right. as far as the seder. Right. But do Haggadah? How much do Haggadahs, or in our specific uh, conversation, how much in medieval Haggadahs is wine paid attention to, at least visually? Excellent question. Um, you will see, obviously, in in most uh, medieval Haggadot which were illuminated, that is hand-painted in gold, silver colors um, for Jews, not necessarily by Jews, uh, mm -hmm. between about 1300 and the rise of printing, and even after the rise of printing, you'll see necessarily depictions of drinking and um, mm -hmm. and more often of pouring wine. So here you have a... Uh, Wait, I, just, I just want to break in. So for listeners out there, this is, if you're only consuming this on a podcasting platform, this is also available in video form on YouTube. So if you want to check these, any <laughs> and all of these images out that Professor Epstein's referencing, you can feel free to check out the YouTube version. So in a variety of images, you'll see people pouring mm -hmm. wine. Um, you'll see people... Uh, lifting wine cups, uh, uh, and you'll see people toasting each other at the mm -hmm. Seder. Uh, depictions of people imbibing, uh, per se, are not mm -hmm. uh, that common, although yeah. there, there, there are a couple of them. Um, is, and, it, is it more of a focus on the pouring than necessarily the drinking? Well, I would say it's mostly about the toasting. Um, that is the lifting of the glasses in a in a ceremonial manner. And, um, you know, there's a particular there is a toast in the Haggadah, the text that says, right, therefore, we are required, right, to praise and exalt and thank, etc, etc. And that's often illustrated in Haggadahs with an illustration of people at the Seder raising their cups in a mm. celebratory toast because it's the beginning of Hallel. And of course, the direction, <laughs> you know, is to raise the cup. So that's that that occurs. Right. Which is actually, I will point out, an interesting choreographical aspect of the Seder night, which is yes. is using wine and yeah, lifting it up. But I hadn't thought about it as far as the celebratory toasting. So that's right. Yeah. So, you know, it's Wait, part of I, the whole Kos yeah. Yeshua says, so, you know, I will raise up my cup, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So I have a quick question. So you mentioned up until about the printing era, but why 1300, you said, about when, do we have so, anything from prior to that time? So the earliest <coughs> Agadah that survives with mm -hmm. illustrations, because you have to understand that, for instance, in 1242, um, a man that Catholics call St. Louis, and I call King Louis the Ninth, 
uh, burnt 12 to 24 ox carts loads full of books in front of the Place de Grève in Paris, now the mm -hmm. Place d'Hôtel de Ville, the, the, the town square. Um, and those included many, many illuminated books. We don't have, what we, ha what we have in terms of what has survived is exponentially less than what was. Mm. And so the earliest one we have is a book called The Griffin's Head Haggadah. It is mm. from the Upper Rhineland Valley, probably the city of Mainz around 1300. <coughs> and interestingly, all the Jewish protagonists in the book are depicted with the heads of griffins. Griffins <laughs> may seem unusual to you as Jewish animals, but if you think about the one depiction that was permitted in the temple and the, ta the tabernacle, and then in, in the temple, it was of these kruvim, which were lion, eagle, human hybrids. Mm -hmm. And you also know that, you know, in the martyrology that we still say every Shabbat in Ashkenazi synagogues, it describes the martyrs of the crusade uh, era in Mainz as lighter than eagles and stronger than lions. So these, this is the way you showed a commonality amongst Jews. But what's interesting to us here at the Jewish Drinking Podcast <laughs> is the fact that <coughs> um, these Jews, these griffin-headed Jews are depicted as drinking. That's the mm -hmm. earliest one we have, Drew. And then it continues, you know. Um, now, in this particular manuscript, the Lefichat page is very cool because it shows us a group of griffin-headed Jews <laughs> seated together at a table, and they're all raising glasses. I count four cups at the table, and then another dude is bringing in a fifth cup. This then comprises all the famous four cups, right? Four or five. I see I, there's a, a faded yellow one. One? Yeah. Two. Oh, well, there's one in between. Oh, yeah. there's here. Yeah, right. Three, yeah. four, five cups. And actually, yeah. this is a this is a six cup, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this comprises all the um, you know, to to free, to deliver, to redeem, to take, right? Those 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 um uh, uh, verbs uh, describing God's actions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, what's interesting about this scene is that we have men who are depicted with the Jewish hat. And we have women who are depicted with various kinds of snoods and hair covers seated at the same table. OK, mm -hmm. yeah. also <clears throat> the dude who's coming in from the right is bearing a large red ram with twisted golden horns to the table. <laughs> so we yeah. have to ask ourselves, since you're interested, right, what's mm -hmm. what's is this a depiction of a satyr? as it would have been. You're interested in Jewish drinking. Did Jews drink? What did they drink? What was mm -hmm. it like? Well, yeah. could say it is, but here's the problem. There are lots of depictions of Seder tables in the Griffin mm -hmm. set. Huh? They usually depict two figures, two male figures, engaging in the various rituals, breaking the matzah in half, eating the maror, mm. right? Finding yeah. the afikomen. When you have men and women, they are depicted at the far ends of the table from each other. Hmm. They, moreover, are very different in their composure and their demeanor. The men are reading books. The men sometimes have cups. The women are sitting with their hands in their laps. Hmm. It's only in this illustration. So it stands out from the rest of the Haggadah. It does. And women hmm. participate because... Hmm. There are several Pesachs in this Haggadah. There's really? the primeval Pesach, that is the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, mm -hmm. which allegedly occurred on Pesach. Mm -hmm. There's Pesach Mitzrayim, the original Passover in Egypt, shown mm -hmm. with the sacrifice of the sheep. There's Pesach Dorot, the Passover that was instituted at Mount Sinai, where you see again the Passover uh, animal. I'm, I'm deliberately being ambiguous here. It's a ram being mm -hmm. roasted. That's why it's red, right? Mm -hmm. And there is Pesach in our day, which is the medieval times. Men and women, women sitting passively, men far away from <laughs> them, right? But yeah. this image is Pesach Lavo, the restored Pesach of the Messianic future in which the Korban Pesach is present, the sacrificed ram to distinguish it from the lamb that could be mm -hmm. confused with Jesus, and where men and women sit together and drink together at the table. 
and that should be important for your Jewish drinkers, right? Mm. Uh, this idea that one of the characteristics of Passover in the Messianic future is that men and women will raise the cup together, maybe blessed together, maybe, right? Everybody mm -hmm. will sit at the table as equals. That's great. Hey there, I wanted to see how you're enjoying the episode so far. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, anything, please let me know. And also, if you have topics, as well as uh, potential guests, including, who knows, maybe yourself, please let me know. Feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Thank you, and now back into the show. I just wanted to say one other thing about the women, mm -hmm. which is that there are Haggadot that depict, as in this one, um, where you see at the bottom, I'm speaking for our podcast listeners, uh, mm. the raising of the dead, the resurrection of the dead. Mm. And at the top, Elijah leading the Messiah into the rebuilt Jerusalem. Mm. Um, this is a German one, one from Ashkenaz um, uh, around uh, 1420s. But an Italian one from a slightly later date shows us the Messiah on his donkey. Mm on the ass, so to speak, of the ass, uh, are the father of the household and the son. Mm -hmm. And Nebuch on the tail of the donkey are the wife with her prin elaborate princess headdress and the daughter. Everybody's beautifully dressed. Everybody's mm -hmm. very Italian. But let's exercise your drinking Jewish art skills, uh, Rabbi. Tell <laughs> us what you notice is going on in this image in terms well the of woman towards the back has is holding a, a cup right and it almost seems full of wine yes it is full of wine yeah. and in fact it's only the woman who gets the cup here right so huh. what do you what do you think you know when you see an image like that what does it percolate for you in terms of patronage in terms of status what would you say let's see your skills in the art historian <sighs> I don't know. I mean, one thing that the, the thing that pops out to me, not necessarily about the drinking, is the descending size of people. Good. Uh, as okay. as we descend uh, this animal, but right. I mean, it does it does. If I wanted to focus more on the wine, it is bizarre that someone could have a an entire entirely full cup of anything <laughs> while riding on an animal. <laughs> That's true. You could build a sukkah on the back of an elephant, God knows. But, you know, <laughs> right. to, as the Gemara tells us, right? But mm -hmm. to have a full cup, right? But also, it's possible that this book was made, as many illustrated books were, for a woman, right? And okay. so it picks her and not the husband as holding the cup of wine. And that says something about status and patronage. You know, mm. we have, um, we have uh, a sitter from exactly the same era, um, actually the same uh, dates and almost the same place uh, that we know was written for a woman. And in the morning brachas, the morning blessings, it says, instead of thank God for not having me made, made me a woman, it says, mm -hmm. thank you, God, asatani isha ish, for having made me a woman and not a man. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't say anything about halacha, Jewish law. It says nothing. What it says is that whoever pays for the book, <laughs> put whatever the hell she wishes into mm -hmm. the book. And I think this is uh, an instance of that, too. So that's that's really cool. But, yeah, I want to talk to you about double cups. You asked about double cups. Yeah. So let's just go back here. So, okay. This is a cautionary tale. So you see this dude, this bird dude on the left. Yeah. He's holding a big red cup. And... Yeah. Um, and my um, erstwhile colleague, she's since uh, passed away, Vivian Mann, who was the director of the Judaica uh, Department of the Jewish Museum in New York, and I, we had an active debate for many years. She would insist <laughs> that what you saw in a manuscript was what existed in reality. And I think I <laughs> disproved that already by showing you this table, which is not about present reality, but about future reality, mm -hmm. right? And she said, well, this is um, this manuscript depicts double cups. And we know because in the hordes that Jews sometimes left behind, what would happen was you would have a Jew who was a moneylender or a pawnbroker or involved in the silver trade. And when trouble was coming, the Jewish family would often bury whatever silver they had in the ground under their mm -hmm. house someplace. And sometimes they had to leave and not come back. And we found in a number of places in Europe, including Cologne and Erfurt, these hordes you see here mm -hmm. depicted on the right of 
um, of silver objects that were either pledges or things used in the household. And among those objects, we've often found double cups. So a double cup is, this is a crushed one I'm showing you from a Jewish hoard, but mm. there is there are some ones that weren't crushed, right? Because they belong to Christians. This is a very interesting example. It's from the cloisters in Manhattan, the great medieval branch mm. of the Metropolitan Museum. And it's a double cup from Germany or Bohemia that has on the top a seal and the seal or a shield has three Jews hats <laughs> connected with their, by their tips. And mm -hmm. then around the side of the cup has the names of the three Kings who come to visit Jesus at his birth. Mm. So it's an odd, it's an odd object. Was it made owned by a Jew and then re repurposed by a Christian for, for epiphany celebrations? We don't, don't know. But it's a, it's a double cup. It has this Jewish association. And this is what they would have looked like. But the fact is mm. that the figures of the Griffin's Head Haggadah are not holding double-headed cups. They're holding tankards, you know, like beer steins, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and, they're much and they're larger than that picture. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you would get, you would could get very drunk from, you know, <laughs> drinking from one of these things. They're large and they're red, meaning that they're not, uh, they, they may not be metallic, you know, or they may mm. be glass and full of wine, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And so Vivian Mann and I went back and forth on this. And I guess the 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 <coughs> the, the last straw was uh, I asked her. So all the creatures in this Haggadah are depicted with blonde hair. Do you think that every Jew in mind <laughs> had blonde hair? And she didn't have an answer. And then I said, well, they also depicted with you know, Griffin's faces. Did all the Jews have Griffin's faces? So the question of what we're seeing, is it real or not, right? So here's an interesting example. This one seems to be a double cup. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, it looks more like the shape of double cup. Well, a long time ago, when I went to see the manuscript of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, they took it off display from me. And I had with me my then um, six-year-old son. And he wasn't really supposed to be there. It's a long story, but he was there. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was looking through the manuscript, uh, I said, oh, look, here's a double cup. And he was six. He said, no, Abba, it's not. I said, why? He said, well, the guy is looking at his nails. So what we're looking at here is a lantern. Hmm. And it's yellow because it's got, you know, a flame hmm. in it. And of course, on top, he's looking at his nails. And on top, it says, bore meore haesh. Clearly, this is Havdalah, and he's holding the lantern to look at his nails. So the mm -hmm. cautionary tale is, as Gilbert and Sullivan said, things are seldom what they seem, right? If you <laughs> think you see a double cup, you may be seeing a lantern. If you think you're seeing a typical uh, Seder in Ashkenaz in Mainz in 1300, you may be seeing a Seder in Messianic times. Hmm. So. Interesting. Wow. I mean, that, I mean, that lantern does look a lot like those cups. It does. It does. Yeah. But, he, but you wouldn't be holding a lantern like this and looking at a cup like this and looking at you. Right, right. And it wouldn't say. But so in other words, the preponderance of evidence is toward um, Gabi's. That was the name of that's the name of that particular son. Gabi's theory that this is a, is mm -hmm. a lantern. And it's right next to the text of Bore Meore Haish. So. I mean, it could be at the same time, it still could be a glass of wine for Havdalah. It could, it except could at that point you wouldn't be looking at your nails. I mean, unless the light, it, the light source is off page, you know, it like they're be. looking at their fingernails and, and then off page is, is wherever the light source is. That's, that's, that's possible, but that's yeah. called a lectio difficile, a the more difficult uh, grasping <laughs> interpretation. <laughs> Uh, rather than the interpretation that's closer to that at hand and would be obvious to any six-year-old. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you've been enjoying this episode so far with Professor Mark Michael Epstein. I know it's a really fascinating one. And since our minds are definitely on the Seder, with Passover just around the corner, I wanted to give you a sneak peek into next week's episode featuring Professor Sarah Ronis on demons and the four cups. Right, if doing things an even number of times is provoking to demons, mm -hmm. then if you don't do things an even number of times, you are protected. Hope you enjoy that sneak peek into next week's episode featuring Professor Sarah Ronas and back into this episode with, with Professor Mark Michael Epstein. So that's really interesting. Thank you so much, Professor Epstein. Now, what about how much uh, is, if, if possible, how much can we discern any attitudes, prejudices, even perhaps even critiques 
about wine or drinking from the way it's illustrated in these medieval Haggadahs? Okay, excellent question. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this because it is a theoretical rather than a practical uh, aspect. And, you know, I myself am a theoretical rather than a practical drinker. Um, I, <laughs> I get so, <laughs> if I, if I, if I had, you know, I just want to put it out there. I did not interrogate you as to your drinking no, predilections, but no, no, but I go but for I, it. I, I, I think <laughs> I figured there was some issue with interrogating people, but I have to confess that, you know, if I would have a revius of wine, you mm -hmm. know, I would have the requisite amount of wine for one cup. I would be under the table. So wow. I, I got myself a heter permission to use grape juice and what to if, say it because otherwise I couldn't say the Hagoda, you know? Well, so. you, you could also dilute it. You could, uh, you know, heavily dilute it with a bunch of water. <laughs> do it like they used to do it like they used to do in Greco-Roman times where they dilute it. Right, get some condition, right? Uh, yeah. I'd rather drink. You know, I'd rather drink good grape juice, organic grape juice, uh, than um, than watered down uh, condition. But uh, yeah. I'll take that under take that under consideration. Yeah. So, um, so you know, there is a Haggadah called the Barcelona Haggadah, or if you are Catalan, the Barcelona Haggadah, um, or have a lisp. Um, and um, <laughs> the, the the Barcelona Haggadah was made probably in Barcelona around 1320. And what's cool about it is that, like many Sephardic Haggadot, before the text of the Haggadah, we have a number, a series of illustrations in little squares, four on a page. Each square is like three inches by three inches. And <coughs> these, if you opened up the book, you'd see a, a framework of eight little squares telling stories from the beginning of Bereshis, beginning of the Genesis through Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim, through the Exodus from Egypt. So you have a sort of prehistory of the Exodus. And necessarily among these are illustrations of Genesis, which include, what's your favorite episode in Genesis? Well, Rabbi. wine's introduction through, right. in chapter nine of Genesis with Noah. Yeah. Right, so, so Noah. So you have Noah. So on this little page, which is uh, folio 3R, you have Noah's drunkenness, then you have the Tower of Babel. Then you have a Midrashic um, account of Nimrod trying to kill Avra, Avram. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Annunciation of Isaac's birth. Now, the way the pages are organized, the images echo each other across the page. So in the Tower of Babel and Nimrod illustrations, they're diagonally across from each other on the page, and they're distinguished by strong verticals, the mm -hmm. tall tower and the tall throne of Nimrod. In the other direction, everything's more horizontal. So the Noah, the Noah episode occurs mm -hmm. mostly on the ground, mm -hmm. okay, um, right? And that's mm -hmm. in the top right. And Abraham's entertaining the angels is also sort of a horizontal play. So you see the association of these two things. Mm -hmm. Now, without saying a word, just looking, as we would say in Brooklyn in my day, at the pictures, Right. There is <laughs> yeah. a critique that is evident. The critique that we see is that Noah is self-absorbed. He's become drunk and he's fallen asleep naked mm -hmm. versus. So he's his result, by the way, is no future offspring, because according to the Midrashic interpretation of the text, he is castrated by his son versus Abraham. I, I just want to. I just want to point out it. It isn't. It, there are multiple possibilities as to yeah. what ha, what Ham did to his father. Yes. And for for those interested, people can check out that episode of what <laughs> what oh. did Ham do to Noah. So that's a totally separate episode. One. Cool. I would say episode number four or five. It's an early episode. Okay. So that's yeah. But cle but clearly, I, I just I just had to throw in that plug for anybody who hasn't checked that episode out. I'm going to check, check it out. out. Yeah. I'm going to check it out immediately because I'm very interested in Ham. Oh, oh great. But, um, but clearly for the authorship of this book, right, the, the rabbinic consultants who consulted on what was going on, mm -hmm. they associated this across the page with no Abraham's selfless benevolence, which mm. uh, Sarah, Sarah's modest self-concealment as opposed to Noah's immodest exposure of himself, right, mm -hmm. which leads, of course, to future offspring. So there's this inherent critique in the art. The other interesting thing is, 
if you look at these dudes, the, the sons of Noah covering him, there's two scenes here. Noah is cultivating the vine mm-hmm. on the right. And on the left, he's naked. He's, a lot, he's, he's, um, he's asleep and his sons are covering him. Mm-hmm. And you will, <coughs> you will note, uh, first of all, the horizontality of it and the basket of grapes. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. As opposed to Noah's um, missing genitalia, right? Um, they're on the same plane. And then if you look at the Abraham illustration, you'll see that there's wine in a flask and Abraham is pointing towards Sarah's womb. Mm. So there's an association with the grapes and Noah's lack of fertility in this interpretation mm-hmm. and the wine of hospitality and Sarah's um, preternatural fertility. Um, right. and She's hidden in and is, is going to bear more progeny versus Noah, who right. is naked and, and not. Also, there's another similar visual similarity. They both have basically bushes or trees in them. Yes, yes. Which, which is kind of funny because I don't usually, like I'm, I don't usually think of grapes as growing in bushes per se. Right. Um, <laughs> but maybe that was done because Abraham was, you know, at the, the you know, the terebinth, the mamre, as it were. But, oh, oh, that's very cool. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. I'm give you a footnote in my next obscure publication. That there we go. There we, and I think that they threw that in to be more bush-like as opposed to more vine-like to reflect uh-huh. this, the, this tree here for Abraham. I, th- I, think you, I think you're right. I think you're mm-hmm. right. So yeah. what you have here is, Noah's wine, which is this instrument of drunkenness and selfishness, right? Versus Abraham's wine, which is an instrument of hospitality and blessing. And Mm -hmm. I I didn't mean to imply that the critique is a critique of drinking per se. It's a critique of the use of alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. For uh, non-productive, so to speak, and productive um, um, uh, purposes. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Noah's loins, uh, uh, castration, infertility, no future er- offspring. Sarah's womb, preternaturally fertile, infinite future offspring that we have. Mm-hmm. So there's this, um, that's going on. Now, uh, that's on the simple level. There's also another level here, which is the level of drosh and the level of son. <laughs> that, yeah. um, that is that uh, here, Noah's sons who cover him, it says, Ufneim achoranit, right? Their faces were averted. Backward. Mm-hmm. backward right um and here mm. right when the god was displeased with the israelites it is said the cherubs the angels on the ark would turn their backs on one another mm. but in the illustration of abraham the two angels who are not engaged in the activity are facing each other as of course famously the cherubs on, on the ark would turn toward each other when everything was good. So it's a further mm. sort of um, connection <coughs> or mm. disconnection between these two illustrations. So you really see this thoughtful, I think, um, uh, consideration of uh, what drinking uh, can mean or, um, or, or, or should mean, um, mm-hmm. just to, to recapitulate, right? Um, the Zohar itself um, says... Woe to the world when one cherub turns away from another, for it says their faces were toward one another in Exodus, and that is only then is there harmony in the world. So you have Hmm. this um, level uh, uh, that's echoed in the Zohar, which was beginning to be published in just this same period. Oh yeah, it's that time of year. Passover is just around the corner. It's on its way. It's time to get rid of your chametz or sell it if you prefer. And I've got resources for you at jewishdream.com slash Passover. And of course, if you have any suggestions, ideas for anything that's not in there and you would like to see, please email me at drew at jewishdream.com. I'd love to hear from you how I can make more robust resources for you for Passover. All right, back into the show. We discussed a little bit this sort of messianic say to table, but um, really, you know, I guess in some way history <clears throat> is framed with wine, because if you can talk about Genesis, possibly according to Rebbe Mayer, beginning with wine, and then you could sort of go to the end of history where the, the cup 
right, is overturned on Edom, right? You know, this whole metaphors of, you know, of the of the wine cup of fate that's been, you know, that's being poured out. Um, and, and that's actually reflected in art as well. And one of my favorite illustrations is, um, is this one from the Barcelona Haggadah. It is a, an illustration that's interesting because it takes place in three different historical registers. So the text is the famous Avodimayinu, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Mitzrayim, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's in the middle of the page. And on the, in the other illustrations on the page, you could see on the bottom of the page is this fellow treading out um, uh, clay to make, oh, clay. right? Clay, mm -hmm. right? And then here there's the frames of making bricks and here the bricks are being mm -hmm. lifted up into this tower and here <laughs> the enslaved Israelites with the taskmasters, right? Mm -hmm. But at the very top, right above the word of Adim, is this very interesting illustration which shows a dog serving wine, there's a wine flask and a, and a cup, to a hare who is seated on the throne. <laughs> and this seems, you laugh, and you should, mm -hmm. because it seems like a typical type of medieval illustration, something we call the mundus inversus, the inverted world, in which mm -hmm. the stuff you think would normally happen in your universe, that is, dogs pursuing hares, is turned on its head. And mm -hmm. what we see in Haggadah illustrations and in much of Jewish art is this imagined projection of what the world would be like at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. So in this image, on this page, in fact, what you see is Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves. But one day, mm -hmm. one day, right? Mm -hmm. The Egyptian dog will serve us. And you really see this parallelism between the bent over dog and the bent over Israelite here, right? Mm. <laughs> and, you know, the idea of this burden and this idea of freedom from burden. Now, the hair is an unlikely symbol for Jews because it's not a kosher animal. But in fact, I wrote a lot about this for many years ago, and it's sort of become part of the literature. The hair becomes a symbol for Jacob and his sort of tricky trickiness. The hands hmm. are the hands of Asa, the hairy paws of Asa. But the voice is the voice of Jacob. The hair is an animal that chews the cud, but does not have split hooves. So it's like, you know, the pig is the opposite. It has split hooves, but it doesn't chew the cud, <laughs> right? So the hair externally appears not kosher, but inside, so to speak, is pure. Right. And so the hair becomes this this symbol, you know, it can it can cross borders. It's swift to flee whenever it can, um, and it becomes this sort of homegrown symbol. It's not in text, but in art, very much for this sort of triumph of Israel. And we know this is the messianic future because we have these two meorot in the sky, and we know that in the eschatological future, the light of the sun will be like the sun of the moon, light of the moon. They're the same size, hmm. and I think it's interesting that 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 wine plays the central part here. It's not like the hair, the dog is tying the hair's shoes or doing the hair's hair or, you know, or yeah. whatever it would be. So what do you make of that? I, I mean, yes, <laughs> it's hard to argue. I mean, it, it is an interesting way of, I mean, it's a, it's a very clear form of service or, or of being a servant is the serving of wine. And, and also, I think it, it could have just been that the dog provides a cup, a goblet to the yeah. hare, but it's also it, it's also carrying and containing the 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 jug in which the wine is. So that literally their hands are full. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think it's it's a very cool image, and of course, mm -hmm. it evokes other eschatological images that we find in Jewish art. For instance, the Ambrosian mm -hmm. Bible, which is the first illustrated Bible we have around twelve seventy two. That's again. True. Mm. Not to say that there weren't before, right? right. <laughs> the earliest surviving. It has this very cool page of cosmological and mm. eschatological, that is universe mm. and end time illustrations. And the mm. end time illustrations include the famous behemoth and um, Leviathan, these creatures that will fight for the for the 
um, uh, pleasure of the tzaddikim, the righteous, who in their <laughs> lifetime never went to Madison Square Garden, but except for the Siyum Hashas, you know. Uh, but now they're right; they're gonna, they're gonna, they go to Madison Square Garden where they can witness the the conflict of these primordial beasts, and then God will step in with a with a sword and slay them. You know, you have to ask <laughs> if you're gonna have Shorabor, which is you know the best pastrami that there ever was. Why yeah. do you need the Asad? Why do you need smoked fish? Well. Some people don't trust the erbishtis, don't trust the <laughs> slaughtering. So, you know, they'll just have the fish. Um, but, but okay, so, but at the table beneath them are these uh. magnificent animal-headed creatures. Now, what's so interesting is that mm. if you look at them in the pots on the table are little chickens, they're little chickens. Hmm. So everybody is ready to eat the chicken, the cow-headed one, and the lion-headed one, and the lion he lioness-headed one, and this one, we don't know what he is, right? Ready mm -hmm. to eat the chickens. The only one who's not eating chicken is the bird-headed creature. He's like, no, I don't, I don't feel cannibalistic today. Mm -hmm. So instead of eating chicken, he has a piece of bread, I'll just have the bread, yeah. and he's drinking right in the center a goblet of wine. Hmm. Right? It's so, so like the elevated moral conscience, right? Even among the tzaddikim, the greatest of the tzaddikim is not even eating, is subsisting on, on the wine that in the <laughs> Akdamut, which, which is the poem that tells all about this, right? The mm -hmm. wine that is stored up for the tzaddikim in the future time, right? Mm. So it's, it's really a beautiful, to me, it's, it's a beautiful image. And on the bottom, there are, there are uh, some vessels, some of which presumably for wine. Mm -hmm. right? And we do have these covered cups here as well, a couple of yeah. them. Oh. So bizarre, you know, eschatological images. This is a little milder one, of course, with the, mm -hmm. with the, with the woman uh, raising the cup at the end. Um, I, I actually want to conclude by talking about my relatives. Sure. Yeah, actually, you know actually, that. before we get there, actually, before we get to your relatives. Oh, okay. Because why Wait, not? No, I just, I, we'll get there. Uh, so what about, uh, it, does wine not come up altogether that much visually in these medieval Haggadahs? Well, I think we've... I mean, some some that. might be more in the background. I don't know right. if there's any more choreographical aspects like we saw that with that Lefichach one about the, the beginning of Hallel. I don't know if um, some of it is just more, more background wine that, that's just totally otherwise... Um, oh, there we go, a Lachmanian one. So, yeah. So you, you do have them. Uh, you do find mm -hmm. it. Um, and you do find wine being poured, wine glasses being held, um, and they're often in proximity to mm -hmm. the book, to the Haggadah itself. Oh. Which is why I want to talk about my relatives. Okay. These, these are the wine. <laughs> these are the wine steins, okay? okay? But I'm not interested in the wine steins. Yeah. I'm interested in the wine stains, okay? The okay. most interesting part of these books for me is not the beautiful illustrations of the lovely color or the gold or the medrash that's behind them or mm -hmm. the liturgy. I love them as physical objects. And I love seeing a page like this where the dude is pouring out a cup of wine for this other guy sitting in his elaborate throne at the Seder table. Mm -hmm. and the whole page is covered with wine stains from the 1300s because this is the place we lift the cup. Mm. This is you're holding, you're holding the kos, you're holding the wine cup directly over this beautiful illuminated book that costs the equivalent <laughs> of six hundred thousand dollars in the year 1300, right? You know, and there it is, you're getting wine stains all over. And here you see this happening in the hispano Moresque Haggadah, hmm. and you see it on all the pages. And in some sense, Drew, you could say, oh, right, what a terrible thing, you know, like these wonderful books that should be in a museum. Well, no, they shouldn't be in a museum. They should be at your table, and they should be dafka under the wine cup that you're holding in your hand. Hmm. And in that sense, the wine stains have often outlived the erasures and the um, the um, the uh, uh, workings over of the censors who tried to censor certain parts of these books. It's the wine hmm. stains that testify to their Jewish use and their Jewishness, and they're part 
of a living tradition of used and useful liturgy. And um, I think it's, I think it's to me, you know, really the most touching part. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause I, I, that that's something that we contemporarily experience. There's, it's hard to find, you know, used Haggadahs, the people that use it every, year to year that are somehow unblemished, that are untouched by any wine, you know, an errant drop here or there, a spilled glass, you know, it, it um, but that's, it's funny. Cause like for us, it's totally inadvertent. It happens. Um, but it's also really curious about that sort of, uh, spatial proximity between the, the holding of the wine and literally the, you know, the book, the Haggadah is being held so closely. Yes. Yes. I'll tell you one more thing. And I Wait, think do I, they have, what, do they have tables? What, what yeah, was yeah. their material culture like? Do they, yeah, yeah. They, they had tables, you know, they oh, okay. had the tablecloths, right? Mm-hmm. So this represents a table and, and the cloth, mm. um, okay. <laughs> you know, by the 1300s, they certainly, they certainly did. Um, Speaking of wine being out of the cup and onto somewhere else. Um, did you find much about uh, the dropping out of wine? I didn't know if it was depicted visually in these, I guess. Oh, no, it's not depicted visually. You know? Oh, really? No, however, no. Okay. However, on the page, yeah. of Tim Zehadam, right? Mm-hmm. Or whatever, you know, yep. you will find a lot of wine stains, right? <laughs> okay. There's actual evidence that people were turning the pages with their wet hands. I mean, <laughs> librarians today who insist that you wear white gloves when you touch the books, which is not such a great idea, I believe, but okay. Hmm. Um, you know, because you have to be in contact with the parchment, otherwise you might rip something. It's, it's, hmm. there's a debate about this, but librarians, they would go absolutely out of their minds, right? If they, you know, watching <laughs> a stater in which these books had been used. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. I want to break in again, and if you have ideas beyond the show, beyond the podcast, beyond this video content, if you have ideas for what Jewish drinking can bring you, whether it's, who knows, maybe it's Zoom sessions, maybe it's uh, events, maybe, who knows, swag, please let me know. I'm very curious to hear from you any ideas, things that we can do, things that I can bring you from Jewish drinking. So feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. I'm happy to bring that to you. All right, now back into the show. I wanted to conclude just with one observation. You know, we talk about Haggadot as if everybody had in their house a set of Haggadot to go around the table. But the fact is that these books, these manuscripts, here I have the Griffin's Hand Haggadah, Mm -hmm. which I stole from the... um, uh, Israel Museum, when I viewed it that time, actually mm-hmm. what they have there is a facsimile. They don't realize it, but uh, don't, don't broadcast <laughs> it. Okay, it's right? just between you and me. Just between you and me and your mm-hmm. hundred million uh, <laughs> listeners. Can you hear me? can you hear me? So <laughs> what's interesting is that, that a book like this would have cost like really the equivalent of an architect designed home today. Oh, wow. We're talking about books that were made for the elites of the elites of the 1%. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, even so, Drew, mm-hmm. if we open this Haggadah to the page of the Kiddush, and here it says, mm-hmm. So it says, Somebody about a hundred years later, or maybe less, puts a line on the top. And then mm-hmm. in the margins here, it says Chag Hasukos. Huh. What do you think that means? How do you interpret that? Well, they reused it for, uh, right? It's a, sim- it's a very similar structure to the, br- to the blessing. And so they just brought out their goddess for Sukkot. And why? Why? I mean, it's... Think money. Think money. Think money. Think money. How many Haggadahs did they have? Oh, oh right, right. Probably not so many, but also this is pre-printing press. So it was. They yeah. had, they had one book in the house. Not one Haggadah, one book. It really? Even, even for these there. wealthy people? Even for Come these. On. How many, how many $600,000 books do you have in a house? Right. In a, in a, <laughs> in an environment where people are making the equivalent of 17 cents a year. Right. Wow. Maybe. OK, mm. that was the book they had in the house. Maybe let's say they were extremely wealthy. Maybe they had a homish. 
but there's no kiddish in the chumash, right? So mm. they're sitting in the sukkah, and the, the, the person leading the seder says, no, bring the book with the kiddish, right? <laughs> and what's the book with the kiddish? The book with the kiddish is what we know as the Griffin's Head Haggadah, and that's why it's written in the margin. Very good detective work, Rabbi. You should, maybe you should consider <laughs> a different line of work. You know, a liquor store owner, um, a detective, you know, something like that. Um, but that's, to me, that's very touching also. Wow. You know, and it's daft at the moment of the kiddish that, that you want to have. You want to have that in front of you. Wow. So. That's really, that's awesome. All right. Okay. Well, Professor Epstein, this is really incredible. I want to thank you so much. Um, do you have anything you want to plug aside from your I don't have Haggadah's anything. book? I don't, I don't have anything I want to plug. My Haggadah's book is out of print. You could call Yale University Press and clamor to them to put it back in print. Um, but considering that I took my next book to a different press, they're not going to do that. Um, but uh, I don't have anything to plug. I just want to plug you. I think this is a terrific idea. And that and and the fact that I love to hear this out of my own voice and did most of the talking um, <laughs> should, should not deter anybody from listening to these wonderful podcasts, a, a number of which I listened to. It was well, odd you. when you contacted me as a non-drinking Jew. Um, you know, I was like, what if, you know, how is how is this Shaykh? You know, why should this be interesting to me? But mm -hmm. I am fascinated now. I'm going to go back to episode one and awesome. listen to every single one. So thank you so kindly. And by the way, I will point out you are not the first and you will not be the last guest who is not a self-identifying drinker. So oh, good. Yes. Yes. I, I welcome all. <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful. All well, right. So for anybody, for yeah. Yeah, thank you. So for anybody interested, you are welcome to check out, if you're interested in these Medieval Haggadah Insights by Professor Epstein, feel free to check out, was it 2015 book? 20, when was that? 20... Skies of Parchment, Seas of Vegas, 2015. 20, that's, oh yeah, that's then 2011 from, Yale book. From, from uh, Princeton University Press, but um, you know, um, there's a lot of great material out there on Haggadahs and on art made for Jews. So enjoy. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. And also, I will point out, I may have published dozens of these episodes, but this is the very first time I've had a guest bringing their singing talents to the show. So I want to <laughs> express a special one note of, of Jewish, Jewish drinking songs. I think we could, you know. So I do have some some stuff in the in process about music and drinking because it's it's a thing. It is apparently. a thing. Yes. Yeah, so Rambam was not keen on it. He didn't want uh, music and, and drinking mixing, but... Uh, yeah. Stay tuned. Well, yeah. Right. It'll it'll, it'll right. happen. <laughs> All right. Call to. All right. Thank you so much. And L'chaim. 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 L'chaim.